so I wanted to present on a, a lady that played the COVID card uh, in a more dramatic fashion than anyone has before. And uh, I wanted to see how the Coates model is, is coping with these uh, people who are willing to manipulate the COVID pandemic for their own benefit. Uh, and so that's really why I present this case today. So um, this happened over the holidays. We had a 28 year old young uh, white female uh, self pay for, lives far away from here. Uh, I think far away from you guys as well, that uh, uh, on, on December the 4th um, started in, in our program, uh, and I was actually out, but we have uh, a coverage physician, so um, this person, they, um, they, they played the COVID card and they also um, had some benzo misuse seems to have been the reason for, for playing the COVID card. So, so the questions I have out of the today's case are uh, have to do with management strategies that have been employed for patients um, at WVU and elsewhere uh, throughout the state for patients who are avoiding drug screens uh, by saying they either have COVID when they don't, have COVID when they do, but that they can never come back again since they've had COVID, are exposed to COVID at all times, never have been had a week that they haven't had a COVID exposure. Um, and and I was curious if, if West Virginia University already had developed some written policies to help to cope with this. I was hoping to get some policies and put them up on the walls and get get patients discouraged from this um, behavior because it, it really I feel like it threatens the whole program. And uh, whenever uh, patients see one patient getting away with this, they all start doing it pretty quickly. Um, also, because this patient was using benzos um, uh, pretty badly, uh, uh, I didn't know if maybe when you combine uh, that dishonesty with the uh, uh, false COVID report, if that is, is handled any differently than uh, dishonesty about uh, Substance use. When we get into the specific case, I think that that question will be more clear when I'm asking about. Um, and then, um, in sort of my final, I'm going to see this patient again tomorrow. And so, one of the big questions I'm wanting an answer for is whether it's appropriate to give her inpatient only, no meds, or uh, one day at a time, or maybe two days even at a time. What what is the what would be the response? Because I'm not sure she even could go inpatient um, with what I have, but um, that I have concerns about benzos and not showing up and not getting drug screens. So, so let's start the case. Um, on December the 4th, she came for intake. She had already been uh, on Suboxone by a ProAct in Huntington uh, who had asked her to go inpatient. We don't know why. And then Hope for Tomorrow had just discharged her two weeks prior to coming to us. She had filled a clonopin script, and that was why she was discharged. She was uh, taking sub suboxone 16 milligrams daily. She, had, she said she had continued herself on that from the street after the discharge, and she just wanted us to pick up with her uh, suboxone. She had, uh, she told us that she, although she picked up the clonopin, that she trashed them before taking any, and it was not in her drug screen, which showed uh, cannabis suboxone only day uh, one. But she did report at that time, averaging 10 clonopin in a day, but has not used any in two weeks or more. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I don't have any more detail than that. I'm not sure what that means. Um, uh, later on in the course of our, uh, her being in our clinic, she ended up refilling uh, that prescription December 17th. We never knew about it until just this morning, actually, when I decided to fill this case out and when I discovered it uh, on a board of pharmacy check. So um, when she first came to us back in December, she said she was under a lot of family stress, has kids, but they don't reside with her. They live with the biological mother and she also helps take care of her 73 year old grandmother. She uh, had a negative pregnancy test, but didn't complete any of the hepatitis HIV testing that we asked for. Uh, I presume we were going to get it later. Um, this kind of becomes a pattern of her providing 
saying she's going to give me information later and not giving it. Uh, she, she was in Branchland. I don't know where that is. And uh, she had reported having a car and cell phone when she first came. But um, all my efforts to get her to come give drug screens, uh, she's saying she can't make it. The car is illegal too far. Um, the, these, I didn't really start upping the pressure for these drug screens until two or three weeks after the COVID car test. Um, uh, she, uh, she, she, I, I don't take, I don't make people come in, uh, if they say they have COVID and I assumed that she was going to follow through with her, uh, statement that she told me, uh, that she was going to, uh, bring me documentation of, of getting a uh, positive COVID screen. But we did that here in a bit. I'll just quickly skim through her intake drug history. Uh, marijuana since age 13, had smoked a day before coming. Uh, alcohol, uh, at first at, at age 19, uh, hadn't drink in a month. Oxycodone at age 16, uh, last year's two months ago. Um, she said um, hydrocodone was recent use one month ago in the report to the care manager, but uh, when she spoke to that physician the same day, she said two weeks ago, uh, uh, oxycodones uh, started in the 20s, most recent use reported two years ago, and benzos, most recent use reported two weeks ago, first use 14. Street suboxone two years ago, uh, uh, the there was a, a discrepancy between what she reported to the care manager and physician again that day, which is uh, two months ago was the last use to the care manager, but to the physician, she was still using it just to, up until the day before. Um, and then she's a pack a day smoker. Day one, she was given four days, 16 milligrams of suboxone based upon drug screen negative for benzos. She came back four days later. She was an hour and a half late. So she got turned around with GPS, get behind a funeral. Uh, she was seen, gone ahead and seen. Um, uh, UDS was still showing the same thing, cannabis and BUPG only. So she was seen and given seven days of medication. Uh, the third visit, she, uh, she called to talk to the care manager beforehand. She said she had been gone to another doctor and gotten diagnosed with COVID, she needed to do telehealth only, couldn't come to group, couldn't give urine drug screen, but she would bring us the records. So she stayed for a full group. Fourth and fifth visit, exact same thing happened, but we just didn't get the records. We kept waiting for the records. We assumed that she was positive COVID. She did the obligatory coughing on the televideo visit. Uh, uh, on the sixth visit, I was starting to get peeved that I had no records yet, and so, even though she was really, really uh, insisting no, uh, she was getting very sick, very, very sick, not getting over this COVID at all, can't come in, even though it's now four weeks out into this COVID thing. Um, uh, I tell her I'm only going to give her two days of meds, and I want the records, and I want her to stop and give me a drug screen, and, I, and I'm not going to give uh, a normal prescription durations again until I get those things. She says, well, I can't do it. I live too far, two hours away and my car is illegal. Uh, but she goes ahead and does find a way to come in two days later. Uh, and we were in that two days, we were able to call around to the places she said she had been and get some records showing that her COVID tests were negative all along. And well, at least, I mean, I guess she did go to the doctor. Um, uh, she, but she came in and she provided a drug screen showing only Suboxone. And so she was given five days of meds. And that was four days ago. So, uh, so the eighth visit hasn't happened yet. Um, I just discovered this morning that uh, uh, as I was trying to figure out what to do with her, uh, that she had filled that prescription for benzos um, almost a month ago now, three or, three or four weeks ago. Uh, and it's a 60 tablet Quanapin script. Um, and I, um, my plan was one day at medicine at a time until I could talk to you guys, but I got to talk to you guys before I saw her. So that's maybe going to change uh, based on what I can get from feedback. So that's pretty much the whole case. And, um, 
I guess the thing I'd love to hear about most first is uh, what would be sort of the, is there even a, like guidelines to, from WVU that exist yet to get to guide through uh, this situation? Sure. Dr. Morrison, thanks so much for that great case. Um, and it's clear you and your team are trying to figure out a way to help her and meet her where she's at. I'll let the prescri pres prescribers on the call speak to what they would recommend prescription wise. I can tell you for our COVID policy, what we do is tell patients that if they, so, so let's say we call them in for a random drug screen and we wanna see them in person, we let them know if they have tested positive for COVID, then they would have to get us that documentation. And we haven't given it a time frame. It's usually prior to their next appointment or by their next appointment. And if we don't have it by then, then we'll address it to them individually and figure out what that next, next step is. But if they've been exposed to COVID or they're awaiting results of COVID, we still ask them to come in and we ask them to wear a mask. Um, our line of thinking is for our patients is the, the risk of addiction potentially is going to kill them um, than the risk of COVID. So we, we kind of, you know, we have to weigh that out. If again, if and when they say they've tested positive, then we'll, you know, talk with their individual treatment team about, okay, what's the deadline of when they need to have those test results into a spy? And if they don't have them to us, what's that next plan? Generally for us, if a patient does not show to a UDS that they've been asked for, then that resets their days with the clinic. We're very careful with the messaging of we're not resetting their sober days, we're not taking their days from them, and sometimes they can hear it that way. So it's really important that we as a team explain to them your sobriety date to you and your treatment team or you and your recovery team is still really important. It's just about resetting your days with our clinic. And if they don't show to two UDSs in a row than they're asked for, then they're recommended to a higher level of care. So either that's ACOAT or ICOAT or daily dosing somewhere else. So that really speaks to the, the, the way you're handling the COVID um, systematically, uh, but with the benzo part of it, um, uh, that kind of makes this particular case even more complicated. And I'm curious how you all We'd, we'd go from there. Yeah. Oh, if I can add one more. So I'll, again, I'll let the prescribers uh, answer that part. If I can add one more. So uh, one uh, change we've made this year. So prior to the pandemic, we wouldn't allow if, if a, even if a patient lived far away, we would say you still need to come to our facility to complete a drug screen. We have now made that ca caveat in the last couple of months that if a patient lives far away, um, our case managers will work to, to get an order into a facility that's closer to home for them. Um, that can still do a screen for them and get the results back to us. So for her, if she lives, I, I don't know where she is in relation to West Virginia either. If we could find a, a closer place for her, she could still go there and get screened. We, we actually did ask her to do that. Uh, we found a place that was closer, but they refused to screen her because they said that she was reporting COVID symptoms. So. Oh, sure, sure. They also refused to take her as a map patient. Okay. They also, what did Lois say? Lois said that they also refused to take her as a map patient as well. Oh, great. Dr. Bo, was there uh, something you wanted to add as well? Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a lot of our patients um, might, might use that. So I always err on the side of caution, right? So if a patient comes to me and said, yeah, I have COVID, it's been diagnosed. We try to do what you did, like get the records. A lot of times you can't, because maybe they, they might have gotten it from a health provider or somewhere else that's the, more difficult to get the records. You give them the 14 days, yeah? They're gonna be recovered by then, um, and then have them come in. Because if someone is, if they really are positive, then they shouldn't be coming in. Um, but if they're, if they're kind of just being dishonest, you're gonna catch it again in a few months, in a few weeks or months anyway. And the good news is they can't use the COVID test and um, the COVID positive test again because most people do not test be positive if they're asymptomatic for at least six months. So um, I, I would give leeway because you just never know. And then you just and then you just start again. And if they are being dishonest, it will happen again. It's not going to be a one time thing. Um, in terms of the benzos, same thing It's not much you can do in the situation. You can't you know, what you mean you can't force the lady to come in who really might have COVID. I would just wait two weeks and then just come in and go put it back on track. 
thought of the daughter not feeling until they heard, until they heard from them again. You, you, um, I couldn't hear you very clearly on the benzos. You're saying you would wait two weeks before prescribing outpatient Suboxone again, or what? No, I, I would give it to her. I, um, oh, you would. Because, oh, yeah, because the risk of um, so Suboxone and respiratory effort with you with the benzodiazepines. The studies have shown that it's become a problem a problem with overdose and respiratory depression when they're injected, right? And also at the higher doses. So um, I would say, okay, I don't know what she's doing. I'm going to give her the, the benefit of the doubt. I would prescribe the Suboxone because her risk of not uh, of using heroin is worse. And then when I see her in two weeks, getting urine to see what she's doing with the benzos and then come up with a plan then because she can't use the same excuse twice. I mean, you could, but I mean, I wouldn't buy it the second time. <laughs> I think it's a good time for your team to talk to her about her benzo you know, feeling the benzo prescription. Ask her why and what did she use those benzo for? So, uh, on the, you know, sometimes patient takes clonopin, but the urine was negative. I mean, I have seen that many times already. So sometimes I went, we give patients clonopin, like, uh, you know, 0 0.5 or even one milligram three times a day for, a, you know, on, on quick unit, because uh, the patient had this kind of prescription before, but came with negative urine uh, drug screen. So I want to see whether the patient urine drug screen was a false positive or false negative, whatever. So I give them just this, let them take scheduled clonopin and check their urine. Sometimes it's really, it, it came back like a, 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 a false negative. So that's possible. So uh, I think it takes this as a, a good opportunity to, to work with her. That's what I think. Like, uh, you know, like Dr. Boyd said, I think it's very, I mean, this lady, at least she came for the urine drug screen and her urine was only positive for buprenorphine. And there is some motivation over there. Uh, I mean, when, when you're actively using, you struggle with a lot of things. I know you use all different kinds of excuses. I mean, COVID uh, test, uh, we're talking about lying on COVID test, probably is not different from lying like before when we had in-person you know, in, in person groups. We had a lot of people falsifying, falsifying uh, meeting, uh, meeting documents. Believe me, like they're falsifying signatures, all these kind of things. And then how do we handle that? I'm pretty much same thing, I guess. Uh, so it's not just there's somebody, somebody lying about the drug use. They, they, you know, we're talking about they, they're lying because, because there's a reason. So uh, again, and we're trying to figure out why. And she, but one thing, one thing I'm concerned with is, is this person, if this person lives two, hour, two hours away and no transportation, I mean, at this time, I guess probably you still can manage it because most of the visits are kind of virtual. But down the road, when you when you when you change it back to in-person visits, so I, I just think this kind of patients probably are not a really good candidates or good like you know patients for your uh, for your program. It's just two hours away, no transportation, and she definitely I would highly encourage her to find it somewhere else. It's unfortunate. I have, you know, I have several patients who are now living in, in Huntington and, you know, Lewisburg. So I basically we're trying to tell them like you, you can do it now, but down the road when we when we when, when we restart in person visits. So probably, you know, you, we, will, we, will, we have to we have to use the same rule for everybody. So no matter where you live. So that's that's going to make it very difficult. thing I was going to add is, you know, with the information you have about the benzodiazepine script, is an intervention I like to use is to write a letter with the patient to the provider who prescribed the medicine, the clonopin to her, I was indicating that she has a problem with addiction and, and she doesn't want to be given medicines like that any longer. And, you know, I think that's a very therapeutic tool to use with a patient who's doing something like that. You might want to try that. Have the therapist write a letter with them. And, uh, Dr. Waltz here also chatted in saying that patients may also have been told to quarantine for 14 days uh, despite negative tests. So they're not always given the correct information. Thank you for uh, chatting that in. Did anyone else have uh, feedback, comments, or even questions for Dr. Morrison? Feel free to unmute or chat in. 
I'll get philosophical for everyone, or maybe more street. Okay. One of the things that really resonates with me in this case is man, who watched uh, Netflix? Who's got Netflix? You watched The Pharmacist, right? And it's not this guy, right? I, in other records, you're like, oh, are you the pharmacist? You know, on random calls. And I'm like, no, no, that's the dude on Netflix. I'm just a pharmacist. Okay. Um, if The Pharmacist was around in 1996, wow, what a different world we would have, right? If people ask questions. So it's 2021, hot off the presses. I want to pose everyone a question here that this case propels in my thinking as a drug guy. One of the things that comes up in this case, and thank you very much, Ryan, for including it, is the access to this medication in the streets, okay? Now, one of the issues with this opioid crisis, opioid pandemic that we're living through is access, drug supply chain, not the kidney punch to us as healthcare professionals, but the actual supply of these substances because they're no longer prescription once they're in the wrong hands. So um, this patient, I believe it was stated in the case, was getting buprenorphine in the streets. Where did that come from? What's everyone's thoughts? I know you've thought about it before, but in this form, I think it's great to think about. Where did they get that from? Your turn. Well, my understanding is most buprenorphine on the streets are from prescribers. Wait, is that what you mean? Um, how did the person get it? Well, there, because we know that a lot of patients who come to our clinics, um, they might use some of the buprenorphine we give, but a lot of them sell the other half. And that's, a, that's pretty known. Does anyone agree with that? Or perhaps I should say, does everyone agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, in a forum like this, my only two cents to give out there is if I have a brain in 1996, and since it's 2021, I can tell you I'm talking about Purdue Pharma, not the university, not the chicken. Um, what if we had those thoughts with OxyContin? Just think about that. Now, if every person gets twice a day buprenorphine, buprenorphine, naloxone, whatever it is, and we know as everyone is willingly to discuss on a recorded call that will be on YouTube. I'm an expert witness, folks. <laughs> we know as licensed healthcare professionals that it's being diverted. That's a great thought to just ponder a little bit more in your own accord, because I'm not naysaying or anything here. But think about that, because I don't get to write the scripts and I'm not in a capacity to dispense them either. But I am of the mind to say, we know we do. Huh. Yeah, so, I think it's a really good conversations with colleagues from this because this is a problem everywhere, right? So when we go to Triple AP, we talk about this and we talk about, well, what's our response? Because number one, you can't prove who's doing what. And number two, then it comes to the harm risk um, um, a kind of mindset, yeah? So what's more dangerous on, on the streets? Because we know it's being diverted. Yeah, mm -hmm. heroin or suboxone, mm -hmm. and that's I mean, and that's not a justification for it. But when I think about it, um, what do I want my patients using if they're on the street? If they're opioid naive, obviously not suboxone. But if they're on heroin and um, they're trying suboxone, in fact, a lot of our patients come to the program because they've bought it from the streets, and it's been an um, entrance into into you know into recovery. So that's one thing, but unfortunately we don't live in an ideal world. We can't tell you're taking eights and you're taking 16s. And I really commend West Virginia because when I worked in Connecticut, everyone was on 24 to 32, right? It was the biggest money making thing ever. At least here, the states tried to, to, um, to decrease that and bring it down to, you can't get over 16 unless you have a clear medical reason or you know gene metabolism. But I, I would love to hear from other people. Because I always just think, okay, harm reduction, what's worse? Shooting heroin or taking a suboxone? I think, Mark, to follow up on your question and, and Dr. Bo as well, is how much as a medical profession, we have some responsibility being where we are and having created that oxy problem and how much do we do to treat it? And it, it's a tough one. And I think that's why we do strip counts. We try to catch people in that but it's coming from somewhere. Is it coming from my patients? Pro possibly, probably, you know, most likely. Is it coming from 
there are other prescribers that still dole out months, uh, you know, month at a time. And so we tend to, you know, so, but it, it's tough because, you know, strip counts, if somebody's smart enough, to, they're just going to show up, get their two strips a month, take half of it, say, you know, and sell the other half. That's, you know, at, at $20 a strip, that's, you know, um, uh, you know, $280 a week. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the profit on that. Um, but I, I agree, there is some harm reduction. I think the, the risks of it are less than oxy, but it, it is something we need to think about and how do we approach it? Um, because I don't think it's a, you know, oh, don't worry about it. It's a, you know, we should flood the streets with this. Well, that's a different conversation. That's not a prescribing conversation. That's a policy conversation. Um, but, it, but it is a challenge. And so we, we, we bring people in, we, we call pharmacies for lot numbers. Um, we unfortunately, and the the levels that we measure you know we're we're actually measuring you know the tests we do we measure buprenorphine norbuprenorphine levels and naloxone levels but they're not indicative i mean sometimes i'll will see somebody who this level looks really out of whack um and i'll bring them in more and count them more so i think we try um but you're right uh you know um what's the um and and is Dino was saying many, I would say over half my patients now are already coming in on a dose, you know, um, of what they're taking. And, and most of those people are trying to get better. Um, I do think some are abusing it, injecting it, but are they selling it to people to abuse it or are they selling it to people to get off of heroin and now fentanyl? Um, I think there's everything out there a, a little bit, but I, I do think we can't ignore your question. Yeah, and I appreciate both of you saying that too. Uh, uh, perhaps I was going down the road that sounded negative there, but um, I'm working on a CE. Don't steal it, anybody. Uh, it's going to be called Pigs Live, Hogs Die. And it's because, uh, you know, the old 80-20 rule? Well, it's really like 99.9 .9 versus 0.1% of healthcare professionals. Um, the big number, we're all looking to do good stuff, right? Whether it's harm reduction, whether, you know, it's for the good of the people and all that stuff. And then the bad guys in that 0.1%, are where you see the sensationalized stories in the media, right? Um, so I'm pretty, I can't speak for everybody. I'm just gonna assume everybody in this call is in the 99.9, .9, right? We're all doing good things there. It, it's um, my hope is that anyone in a call like this can answer those questions and say, okay, well, if it's heroin versus buprenorphine, what, you know, Paracelsus, one of the grandfathers of pharmacy, it's all about the dose, baby. Um, if we know, you know, it's not necessarily always, and this is just a challenge to, think more broadly there. Um, it's not necessarily heroin versus buprenorphine. What I was asking is about the dose. Do we need the two, you know, that kind of stuff. And in some cases, by the way, we do. <laughs> I, everybody here knows that. Um, but it, it's those kinds of things there. And, and the, um, I, you know, I, I, I think like Adina brought up of, of being in other states, I think you mentioned Connecticut, and they're not alone. It's a lot of other places of seeing like, you know, four times the dose that's in any literature that's out there. Like, come on, can, can you be duped on bup as a healthcare professional any easy, more easily? Um, you know, so I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts, but I, that's something I always like to propel into um, a, a thinking just to, it's physically impossible to uh, mitigate all risk in these scenarios as the healthcare professionals, um, but it does require raising the old, the old eyebrow a little bit extra, so. Thank you so much uh, for posing that question and everything. Uh, Dr. Houston, I noticed you had unmuted a little bit earlier too. Is there a comment you wanted to make? Yeah, at first, Mark, I thought you were trying to entrap us or something like that. Um, so. <laughs> I, had, I like you guys. <laughs> Yeah, friends don't entrap other friends, but um, <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know. But, um, you know, the, the whole, like, diversion thing, yeah, it happens. It, it, it is scary, though, how, like, oblivious some people are to it. Um, we're about to do this big CTN study, and they, they – <laughs> so they want us to put people on 32 milligrams of bupe. Their idea that somehow 32 is better than 16. And I, I brought it up. I'm like, okay, so, uh, you know – maybe one out of 10 people takes more than 16. But when I said it to them, it was like they had 10 heads. They were completely oblivious to it. That, like I was crazy. Um, I don't think people ask about it. I don't think people want to ask. I don't think people care to ask half the time. Um, you know, if, if someone's on more than 16, the first question I ask is how much do you take and how much do you sell? I mean, literally my first question. And a lot of people are so shocked you ask it, they answer it pretty truthfully. 
So, you know, you just being pretty open about it and um, because, you know, that's what gives it a bad name and what makes police and judges and people freak out. I mean, not that other things aren't diverted all the time or historically, like you said, Oxy or Xanax or everything is diverted. I mean, people abuse Imodium for God's sake. So things, things are diverted, but acknowledging it is important, but pretending it doesn't exist is ridiculous too. So that's where we're at. But yeah, don't entrap people, Mark. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, so, uh, doctor, another instance once, I think um, it was in a managed care setting. Um, Tony, you might have been there. I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's many years ago. Um, but uh, a, uh, a provider was requesting for approval for payment. And you know what words I'm talking about there in insurance land uh, for uh, heroin. I mean, uh, buprenorphine, naloxone uh, four times a day. A and like everyone in the room was like, what are you talking about? The half-life is like a day and a half. Like that just doesn't make sense. And, and I, I didn't stand up for the entity, but I did say, you know, you got to try and figure it out psychologically. It's like you have someone that's injecting perhaps four, if not six times a day, they're going on the psychological side of it, of being used to doing that. You know, is that okay for a little while? I, that's for someone in, a, in the professional setting to figure out perhaps not appropriate six months later. Um, you know, to, so, you know, Jeremy, like you said, there, there's all these different things to factor in. It's just looking at that whole 360. So that's that. I'm not entrapping anybody. <laughs> so Mark, I, Mark, I yeah. think you made, a, you made a very good point. Thank you for reminding us. Actually, everybody here, uh, there's a reason why we sit here, discuss all these kind of things. We're trying to be responsible prescribers and responsible clinicians to help every patient is suffering from this uh, substance use disorder problem. So two things I want to mention here. So first, the pharmacologically, we know buprenorphine is different from other uh, opioid four agonists. So that makes us feel better prescribing um, uh, buprenorphine related products. That's, that's first thing first. Second, let me give you one example which makes me feel better. It's like one time we discharged a patient from DDU a couple of years ago and that patient uh, was on two milligram film when she was on DDU. Then we discharged her, of course, with eight milligram film. We did not change the dosing. And of course, she took eight milligrams. She, she, she thought eight milligrams was the same like a two milligram. So she took four uh, eight milligram films. So one, one time. Now, then she came back to us. She told us what happened and gave us urine, urine sample, but she didn't die. So I just want to let you know this is something which you know, which is kind of important. The pharmacological, yeah, this medicine is different. And I also, uh, you know, happened to treat some cancer patients in the past. Uh, uh, when there was, then when, 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 I mean, I, I had three or four patients who were on heavy doses of pain medicine and got like, a, we call it aberrant, abnormal feeling and, you know, prescri prescription feeling problem. Then we, 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 we I, I, you know, I worked with a cancer, te cancer oncologist team and uh, switched them to, buprenorphine uh, for, for pain control. And the big, big difference is when they were taking pain pills for agonists, they were groggy, tired, lethargic, you know, sleepy, and not able to function. But when we changed to buprenorphine, and, you know, their pain did not get, the pain control did not get way better, but at least they were able to function better. So, 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 so that makes me feel, you know, um, uh, yes, buprenorphine related products is a different medicine. Um, we're talking about, you know, comparing with opioid, opioid for agonists. So that's one thing. Second is that we always, we, as a clinician, I guess everybody here, like you, we, our, our thoughts are kind of anchored by what we see. So, so let me tell you one thing I have been, you know, I've been telling my students many, many, many times. It's like, you know, what I have been seeing here in our co clinic is 500 patients. And we have 80 patients already in bi-monthly groups. That means they have been sober for at least three years. And in one of my groups, everybody has almost more than eight years. So I just want to let you know, so this is what I see. So my, my lens is very different from those other providers seeing patients kind of, I still see, I mean, I see different population as you do. But some, unfortunately, some clinicians will only be able to see that struggling population. 
talking about coming back to your to 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 to, to your clinic all the time, struggling all the time with all different kind of problems, maybe falsifying all different kind of records or documentations, whatever, trying to get messed. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, we do. Uh, we here we, we we sit together. We learn how to provide evidence-based treatment to our patients. Do we need to worry about? Uh, you know, giving the wrong prescription to the wrong person who may just divert it for, uh, for, for different purpose. Yes, we do. But as long as we, you know, we sit here, we discuss like you, we have you, we have Mark, you know, raising, giving us questions. I think it makes perfect sense. So I'm hopeful. And I think this new year, I'm very uh, optimistic. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Um, I did want to leave some time for your didactic too. We only have about 15 minutes left of the session, but um, before we shift gears. Oh, sorry, what was that? <laughs> It said pharmacology. <laughs> so um, I, I don't want to be the like the mic drop here because I think that your point is more important there, Dr. Zing. Um, one thing you did mention, though, was the patient that could take four strips, right? Um, the point that I was bringing up earlier isn't whether I can take, actually, I don't know, how, uh, whether that patient can take four and not die. It's whether my 4.5-year-old could lick that film and die. That is a completely different thing because what I'm bringing up isn't your patient. And it's quite frankly, not anyone's patient provider relationship. It's the supply chain, which is the core of the entire opioid crisis. It ain't us, folks. It's the supply chain. And, and, and the, um, Jeremy, you're going to be like, hey, you're, you're, you're doing that again. <laughs> and I'm not. Um, I'm trying to be the 1996 person in 2011, 20, what the heck year is it? <laughs> in 2021 of saying like, look, we failed at that. We need to figure that out now. Like I'll go on record saying, I don't talk to patients uh, even with pain all that much about disposal of opioids. Ooh, did he just say that? You know, I do talk about the storage because there's what, like 25 of us here, 26 of us here. Yeah, at least like a quarter probably have some opioids stored at home, locked up, I'm sure, right? So we don't, we don't want to be hypocrites, but it's about the supply chain. So it, it, that's my whole thing there is the, the reflecting back some decades later, I guess. Um, however, your points there are phenomenal. I'm going to shush because I think we have a didactic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for the, the great discussion and feedback and everything. Um, before shifting gears, Dr. Morrison, I did want to ask you if you had any other questions for your case and, or comments or anything. No, if you have anything else to tell me, just chat me during the didactic. Yep, that sounds good to me. Thank you all so much again. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Morrison, for starting us strong with the new year and uh, giving us a case today. We really appreciate it. So. Um, Dr. Zhang, I'll pull up your didactic for you. Uh, just let me know when you'd like me to advance the slides. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I guess we don't have much time for this <laughs> didactic, but anyways, so I, Mitra gave me a chance, gave me an opportunity to split the didactic into two sessions. So if I cannot finish here, I mean, let's see how much I can do. Then we can just always do a second part next time. So um, I just want to talk about a pilot study, uh, you know, uh, can, uh, done here in our, uh, in our co-clinic uh, for five years, five years ago. So it's a pilot study invest investigating a sleep problem in our co-patient. Yeah, please, next. So the, the learning objectives here, is, uh, uh, first I will brief review uh, a neuro by, um, actually the review article and not by uh, Nora Volko. Uh, on neuropsychopharmacology in uh, 2020. A uh, brief review of neurobiology of sleep and addiction brain. Probably that's what I can do today. And then uh, next I will talk about this study, which is a pilot study. And uh, just to give you a brief report on um, what we, uh, you know, and our objectives and uh, our methods and our results, and uh, also uh, have a brief discussion on what we, you know, our, our conclusions. Okay, next, please. I always like this uh, statement from a uh, Hungarian uh, biochemist who uh, was a 1937 Nobel Prize winner, uh, finding actually the chem, I think that uh, vitamin C, how important it is and how to isolate vitamin C, uh, citric uh, cycle, talking about uh, in the body. So, but anyways, what he said was research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought. 
So we, we have been discussing this actually here throughout this group throughout, you know, in the past couple of years. So we, uh, you know, I, I know uh, we are all clinicians, we're trying to provide help, which, uh, you know, treat patients. But in the meantime, uh, we, uh, we do some studies and trying to try to uh, uh, learn outcomes, how effective our uh, clinic, you know, can help our patients, right? Okay, next, please. So this is the article, Drug Sleep and Addiction Brain. Um, everybody knows Do uh, Dr. Vocal. And uh, yeah, this is published um, in last year's uh, Neuropsychopharmacology Journal. Okay, next, please. So, so what do we know? What do we know about sleep and, uh, and addiction? I mean, I guess every day when you see patients, a lot of times you may ask how good patient's sleep is. And it's so complicated. The problem is like when they use drugs, the sleep won't be good. And when they cannot sleep well, and unfortunately they tend to reuse drugs or they, you know, uh, they may just use drugs to help them to sleep. So it's, you know, we don't know which one comes first, but clinically speaking, and we see this as a phenomenon, everybody here, basically we know sleep and uh, substance abuse, they, they interconnect. So we're talking about, you know, alterations in one process can definitely cause uh, some kind of consequences for the another. So, and during the acute drug exposure, when they're actively using, they have problems with their sleep, you know, time to fall asleep, sleep latency. They have problems with how long they can stay asleep. And they also have problems with the quality of the sleep. And with chronic use, of course, this problem gets worse and worse. Uh, when they try to stop using, we're talking about this population who we see uh, every day, you know, at least they want to stop using drugs. Uh, of course, all these negative problems surface. And a lot of times, because they cannot sleep, because they cannot stay asleep, because they have problems with their sleep quality, they become more impulsive. They cannot tolerate stress. They you know, it drives um, cravings, then they have, you know, they, then they, they tend to reuse, of course. So uh, sleep impairment is associated with the cognitive dysfunction and learning. This is very important. We're talking about cognitive function and how they reason things, how they plan themselves, how they organ organize their daily life activities. Those things are kind of disrupted as well. And most importantly, what is recovery? Actually, uh, you know, I, I think I, was, I, I read an article about learning and uh, addiction, you know, as people say, addiction could be a learning disorder. So basically you cannot unlearn. So uh, this is just one, one way to, 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 to think about addiction. And we know addiction has a neurobiological, you know, um, underlying, we understand that. But the, here's the thing. So, so you cannot unlearn. I, 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 I actually, that's, that's the thing I learned for the first time, I was surprised to hear that. To hear that, so they said you cannot unlearn, unlearn what, what you what you have learned. But the only way to 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 to, to change to make change is to learn new things. So unfortunately, sleep is very very important in our learning from from early age. So it has something to do with the consolidation of our memory which is very, very important. And also it is very important in the process of extinction. This is very important, especially in the recovery process we're talking about, you know, they need to associate new things with their recovery life. So this kind of new learning ability, unfortunately for our patients who are in a recovery, if their sleep is not good, then it may affect their recovery. Next, please. So Dr. Volko mentioned five, six different neural uh, circuitries that are very, very important in, uh, in sleep and addiction. They interconnect with each other, for sure. The first one is locus cerulus, no epinephrine system. Now, Locus cerulus is the headquarter of our central nervous norepinephrine neurotransmitter. So what happens is they found actually this system is active when we are awake. 
and they're kind of almost silent, or at least they're not, re not that active during our sleep. So the stress can cause overactivation of the local cellular norepinephrine system. Now this is essential. We're talking about central norepinephrine system. Okay, so this is very important because what happens is when when stress is terminated, the another part of the system is played by endogenous opioids. We're talking about endorphin, dynorphin, and uh, dynorphin and uh, and caffeine, all those kind of things. Actually, they they they're like extinguishers. So they can lower the activity of low, uh, you know, of this, this system and kind of, you know, serve as a pacifier, which is very, very important. Imagine somebody has been using opioids and has built up high opioid tolerance. Same thing, they will have tolerance to the endogenous opioids. So this is very important. So in other words, they do not have the extinguisher when stress is turned off, but they cannot calm down immediately like normal people do. Because the system, the locus cellulose norepinephrine system is not working you know, appropriately. So that's kind of an interesting finding. Another thing is, actually I'm trying to read this, we, the reason why we, you know, in opioid withdrawal time, so because of hyper arousal and insomnia associated with withdrawal, and we know that we all have this experience, so they're, they're restless, they cannot sleep, they wake up very often, they're like, you know, they're, they're sweating, they're kind of, you know, they're shaking. So we, what do we use? We use the lofaxetine or clonidine. Now we, we use a clonidine patch, right? We use that a, a, a lot. Th those two medications are kind of alpha-2 adrenergic antagonists. What do they do? They inhibit this, the discharge of this circuitry. So that's how it works. That's why they not only can help with tachycardia and any other, uh, we talk about any other uh, peripheral symptoms from sympathetic, sympathetic activation, uh, but also, you know, because of this, you know, because of this system plays a, such an important role in sleep. And this, those two medications can help with insomnia, can help with anxiety, can help with restlessness which is very important. Okay, next, please. So, raffin nuclei, which is headquarter of our 5-HT serotonin system. So 5-HT neurons are kind of, you know, they are very broad. They innervate all different parts of our cortex, which is very important. So, interestingly, 5-HT serves as a sleep promoting factor. So it's like a tryptophan. If you go buy over the over the counter tryptophan, actually it helps with your serotonin level. We know this. We know, we know this neurotransmitter plays a very important role in anxiety, depression. But actually, it also is a very important neurotransmitter for sleep. So if you have in high enough serotonin, and basically people may have better sleep. Okay. Another thing, another important side of this system is our arousal in response to hypercapnia. That means if you have, if you sleep, you don't get enough oxygen, then your respiratory function is kind of uh, not really that act active or, or activated. Then what happens, you build up di carbon dioxide. Then that's gonna stimulate your, your brainstem and that will send information uh, to, to, your, to, to your cortex and to activate all, that, all this kind of circuitries. What's important here is basically it makes it, you know, it makes you arouse, it wakes you up. But unfortunately, for for patients who use drugs, especially opioids, sometimes you use Narcan, they cannot really resuscitate them. Why? Because this arousal response, in response, this arousal, in response to high high carbon dioxide level, is not really functional. So that's another reason why this system is also important. Okay, next, please. So histamine, we, we understand that. Uh, histamine, antihistamine is a medicine we use, Benadryl we use for sleep. A histamine is very, very important uh, for sleep-wake cycle. And because this 
tuberal mammillary nucleus is kind of, you know, very close, it's kind of in a hypotonomous area. So it's very, very much related to food anticipation and also motivation as well. Next slide, please. So then the fourth system she mentioned in the article was uh, actually C endogenous cannabinoid system, ECS, CB1, CB2 receptors. They're targets of marijuana. So they're also very much involved in circadian rhythm and the regulation of sleep-wake cycle. So if somebody acutely uses marijuana, and we heard that many, many times, they try to use marijuana to help them with sleep. So they can sleep better. Yes, that's true because cannabis is sleep promoting and decreases in latency, okay? Basically, they don't need to like a toss and turn for two hours to sleep. It increases sleep time and increases slow wave sleep, which is deep sleep, which is very important for our brain to rest and decreases REM sleep. CB1 signaling may be mediated through sleep promoting molecule adenosine. Adenosine, uh, caffeine is a, an adenosine uh, antagonist. So it blocks adenosine receptors. Basically, it can reverse adenosine and adenosine itself is sleep promoting. So that's why caffeine can keep, keep us uh, awake. It also inhibits arousal promoting orexin neurons and increases the activity of sleep promoting melanin concentrating hormone neurons, which is very, very important. Next slide, please, because I only have two minutes. I will quickly go through this orexin system. So if all those five systems, um, uh, you know, in that previous slides are kind of, they play all very important roles. They, each of them plays an important role, but orexin is the conductor. So this is the conductor. So this is a conductor of the orchestra. So this orexin system, those neurons, you see all those pink arrows, neurons originated from the hypothalamus area. It coordinates the work from all other systems. So interestingly, I'm, you know, I, I only spend one more minute. I, I, I will leave the, the rest of the slides to next time. So interestingly, we talk about dopamine, dopamine pathways which is a very much reward. We're talking about, you know, ventral tegmental area, nucleus accumbens, reward circuitry. And actually it's not very much involved in our sleep uh, cycle. So in other words, it's not over discharging when, we, uh, when, 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 when patients are not sleeping. It's not really that silent when patients is, is asleep. So, however, a Rexon system kind of interconnects with, the reward, with this reward circuitry. In other words, yes, dopamine may not be an important, the most important neurotransmitter in our sleep. However, it's, it's related. I mean, clinically, we see a lot of people try to, try to self-medicate to help them with sleep, or they just use stimulant, try to keep them awake so they can function, so they can stay, you know, stay up for a long time for whatever reason. So, so here's the thing. So orexin is very, very important. We're going to talk about that in the uh, uh, next time, and I'll explain a little bit more uh, what I learned from uh, uh, from that article. But anyways, so what's important here is yes, there are medication that is kind of orexin antagonist, and since orexin plays such an important role, uh, uh, orchestrating um, the you know the other pathways in sleep, so maybe. We're talking about medications that can target orexin may help patients with, with sleep and also may help them with the substance use problem. Talking about the, re, you know, this reward circuitry because orexin, you know, you see all this, all, all these arrows here, pink arrows. Yes, they do closely, you know, uh, connected with the reward circuitry. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang, um, and thank you, Dr. Morrison, too, for uh, such a great session. And thank you all so much for the awesome discussion. I, you all know I hate when uh, the sessions can be cut short. I always wish it was a little longer than an hour, but um, thank you all so much. Uh, our next session will be on January 25th, and like Dr. Zhang uh, mentioned, he'll be finishing the rest of his didactic then. Um, and I do encourage you all to continue submitting uh, some more cases so we can have uh, some more great discussions. So thank you all so much and we'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you.